um, I think it's a, I think it's like a, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be around that. Yeah. Because it truly, it's, it's uplifting. You know, it makes you, it just makes you weed out the circle. When you're around people that truly give you like, uh, give you some good, mm. serve a good value to you in your life, you then look at those that don't and you can, you can then push away. So I'm big on, I'm big on personality. I'm big on energy. I'm big on will and wants. Uh, I believe that is contagious. So if you have a, a bunch of laziness and a bunch of bullshit around you, naturally it's going to feed off. You're going to find yourself becoming what's in your environment. There is no such thing as failure. Failure is an idea because success is also a stupid idea. It's your idea, what is success and what is failure, isn't it? Instead of trying to change the world, change your idea. Isn't it easier? You know, in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, in England, when you met a very poor person, that person would be described as an unfortunate literally someone who had not been blessed by fortune and unfortunate. Nowadays, particularly in the United States, if you meet someone at the bottom of society, they may unkindly be described as a loser. There's a real difference between an unfortunate and a loser, and that shows 400 years of evolution in society and our belief in who is responsible for our lives. It's no longer the gods, it's us. We're in the driving seat. That's exhilarating if you're doing well and very crushing if you're not. It leads, in the worst cases, in the analysis of uh, uh, sociologists like Emile Durkheim, it leads to increased rates of suicide. That is no such thing. These are all social things. These are not existential things. We created the society for our well-being, not to take our lives. Yes? You created your family, your social structure and every other damn thing for your well-being, not to take your life, isn't it? Now every damn thing can take your life. Don't make things that you create things that human beings create larger than your life, that is the basis of your suffering. I got a fucking, I got a life. I got a hell of a life that I've lived full of ups, downs, potholes, cobblestone speed bumps, flat road, U-turns, some smack brick walls that I <laughs> ran into, uh, you know, some revolving doors of back and forth. And through it all, my mental has only gotten better. Because I feel like I've been in, I've been in the mental gym, the mental fitness that that coincides with life. You know, it should get better. It should. You should get wiser. You should get smarter. You should be able to make better decisions. And all of my decisions came from the massive amount of fuck ups, and I can now share those fuck ups. I can now share the rights and the wrongs, and the way that I handle all of the things that I've done. And people can just take that information and go, wow, I never looked at it like that. Most people make a strict correlation between how much time and if you like love, not romantic love, though that may be something, but uh, love in general, respect, uh, they are willing to accord us, that will be strictly defined by our, our position in the social hierarchy. And that's a lot of the reason why we care so much about our careers and indeed start caring so much about... About how to get to success that's the that's the want from everybody across the board on some level right okay everybody's success is different this doesn't mean fame and and stars i'm not talking about that level of success for everything i'm saying whatever your version of success is to get to it information from someone that's done it or that's partaken in it in some degree will only add to the value of your journey it's mm. only going to make it easier it's not to say that you got to do what they said but be, with that information, you're able to process it, maybe use it, maybe not. Right. But you got it. The first and foremost success is that you are not a slave to anybody's idea. This is success. Whatever the situation of life, you're alive means you're successful, isn't it? <laughs> no? 
often actually on a Sunday evening, just as the sun is starting to set and the gap between my hopes for myself and the reality of my life start to diverge so painfully that I normally end up uh, weeping it into a pillow. I'm mentioning all this, I'm mentioning all this because I think this is not merely a personal problem. You may think I'm wrong in this, but I think that we live in an age when our lives are regularly punctuated by career crises, by moments when what we thought we knew about our lives, about our careers, comes into contact with a, a threatening uh, sort of reality. It's perhaps easier now uh, than ever before to make a good living. It's perhaps harder than ever before to stay calm, to be free of career anxiety. And I want to look uh, uh, now, if I may, at some of the reasons why we might be feeling anxiety about our careers, why we might be victims of these career crises as uh, we're weeping softly into our, our, our pillows. Well, because everybody's story is different. Everybody's story is different. And what I find is that it takes time for everyone. For everyone. Nobody, nobody, even the easiest road is still met with some degrees of difficulty. Mm -hmm. At somewhere, some point, you're going to go into some degree of difficulty. For example, I'm watching, uh, you know, the Jordan documentary. Oh man, Last Dance, it's amazing. Did you finish it? Right, I'm gonna tell you what I realized from the Jordan documentary. Wow. It's so dope, so amazing. You wanna know who I've been actually in awe of since watching this? Steve Kerr. Oh man, the last two episodes with him, he's unbelievable. Steve Kerr, people don't even realize this, Steve Kerr, is sitting on eight championships. <laughs> eight Machine. championships. Listen, four with the Bulls, one with the Spurs, and he has three with the Warriors. But in between all of that, what seems like an easy road, a great road, you find out that Steve got punched in the face by Michael Jordan, <laughs> and you find out that this there was these bumps on the way that you would have never known. From the outside, you would have never known that Mike challenged Steve and the pressure that Steve felt when he was on his franchise to do certain thing. And I didn't have the athleticism. If I got passed the ball, I had to hit the shot. You only had five shots a game, all five that, yeah. Five shots a game, but if I missed any of those shots, the ball wasn't coming my way anymore. So I had to make sure. You would have never known. You would have never known. I say that to say and use it as an example for there are no easy roads. So when I was coming up and I'm not getting the auditions, or I'm not getting the opportunities, I had to say to myself, it's going to come. Mm. If I put the work in, it has no choice but to come. Now, as I'm saying that and doing that, I'm looking around, there's certain comedians that were doing the same stuff over and over again for years on years on years. Certain comedians that felt comfortable with just making whatever the money was. It wasn't about the money, it was about the craft. So I knew that if I got better at the craft that I would eventually get to the money. And that's what my focus was. Granted, I'm a part of a very small percentage and I, you know, you have to attach some luck to it. Mm -hmm. and, and the hard work with the luck is an amazing collaboration. Yeah. So it ended up paying off, but I knew what I had to do. So there were no other options. I didn't have other baskets with eggs in it. This was it. We are surrounded by snobs. Um, now, in a way, I've got some bad news, particularly for anybody uh, who's come to Oxford from abroad. There's a real problem with snobbery because sometimes people from outside the UK imagine that snobbery is a distinctively UK phenomenon fixated on uh, country houses and titles. The bad news is that's not true. Snobbery is a global phenomenon. We are a global organisation. This is a global phenomenon. It exists... As, what is a snob? A snob is anybody who takes a small part of you and uses that to come to a complete vision of who you are. That is uh, snobbery. And the dominant uh, kind of snobbery that exists nowadays is job snobbery. You encounter it uh, within minutes at a party when you get asked that famous, iconic question of the early 21st century, what do you do? And according to how you answer that question, people are either incredibly delighted to see you or look at their watch and uh, make their excuses. I understand that everybody's not going to like you. That's, that's, that's a fact. Everybody's not going to like you. And there was one moment where I felt like everybody was supposed to. I felt like really everybody is supposed to like me, man. I'm a nice guy. I'm a lovable, 
nice guy. Why wouldn't you like me? What I found, I was like, look, everybody's not going to like you. Mm-hmm. And, and you can't change that. You can't control that. So it's my job to be happy with my attempt mm-hmm. and what it is that I'm trying to do. That's my job. So, you know, as you're going to perform at said shithole or said small environment, mm-hmm. I realized that each one of those opportunities was a way for me to work on me, my craft. And I'm supposed to take something out of that moment that's good. Whether it's two laughs, whether it's 20, whether it's 100, I have to take something away from this experience and, and basically hold on to it and improve off of that. Yeah. If, if I go do these things and everything about these things are always bad, well, that means that I'm, I'm doing something wrong. Right. They can't always be bad. There has to be something good that's coming out of it. I'm just not, I'm not searching for it. Most people make a strict correlation between how much time, and if you like love, not romantic love, though that may be something, but uh, love in general, respect, uh, they are willing to accord us, that will be strictly defined by our, our position in the social hierarchy. I'm going to give you a very true story. And to my brothers, the Plastic Cup boys, we got our radio show straight from the heart. I'm constantly preaching to us about, it's not about now, it's about tomorrow. Our radio show is a good radio show and we have a following, but it's not about now. It's about tomorrow. We got to put the work in today so that when tomorrow comes, we are well equipped for the conversation that may be. I said, Joe had a fucking long ride of preparing for tomorrow. And when tomorrow hit, it had to hit correctly because Joe never not did the work on a day-to-day basis to prepare for tomorrow. I got everybody fired up just off of the fact that you continue to do your thing the way that you were, regardless of conversations, regardless of other offers and possibilities, you felt something else was on the horizon for tomorrow. But you knew it would come based off of your energy and effort that you put into the thing that you have. Let me explain. I think it would be very unusual for anyone here or anyone watching uh, to be envious of the Queen of England. Uh, Even though she's uh, much richer than any of you are, and uh, uh, she's got a very large house, the reason why we don't envy her, the reason why we don't envy her is because she's too weird. Uh, She's simply too strange. We can't relate to her. She speaks in a funny way. She comes from a sort of odd place. So we can't relate to her. And when you can't relate to somebody, you don't envy them. The closer two people are in age, in background, in in the process of identification, the more there's a danger of envy, which is incidentally why none of you should ever go to a school reunion, because there is no stronger reference point than people one, one was at school with. But the problem generally of modern society is that it turns the whole world into a school. Everybody's wearing jeans, everybody's the same, and yet they're not. So there's a spirit of equality combined with deep inequalities, which makes for a very, can make for a very stressful situation. It's probably as unlikely uh, that you would nowadays become as rich and famous as Bill Gates as it was unlikely in the 17th century that you would accede to the ranks of the French aristocracy. But the point is it doesn't feel that way. It's made to feel by magazines and other media outlets that if you've got energy, a few bright ideas about technology, a garage, uh, you too could start a major um, thing. And the consequences of this problem make themselves felt in bookshops. When you go to a large bookshop and look at the self-help sections, as I sometimes do, if you analyse self-help books that are produced in the world today, there are basically two kinds. The first kind tells you, you can do it, you can make it, anything's possible. And the other kind tell you how to cope with what we politely call low self-esteem, or impolitely call feeling very bad about yourself. There's a real correlation between a society that tells people that they can do anything and the existence of low self-esteem. So that's another way in which something that's quite positive can have a nasty kickback. There's another reason why we might be feeling more anxious about our careers, about our status in the world today uh, than ever before. And it's again linked to something nice. And that nice thing is called meritocracy. Now, everybody, all politicians on left and right agree that meritocracy is a great thing, and we should all be trying to make our societies really, really meritocratic. Um, 
There's, uh, uh, in other words, what is a meritocratic society? A meritocratic society is one in which if you've got talent and energy and skill, you will get to the top. Nothing should hold you back. It's a beautiful idea. The problem is, if you really believe in a society where those who merit to get to the top get to the top, you'll also, by implication, and in a far more nasty way, believe in a society where those who deserve to get to the bottom also get to the bottom and stay there. In other words, your position in life comes to seem not accidental, but merited and deserved. And that makes failure seem much more crushing. And, and I, I don't think people understand how valuable they can be if they use their time correctly. Yes. Now, have you always been like this? Have I'm you always a, been I'm this a positive ambitious? Always? fucking guy, man. But always? Always. Really? I find a light in every dark tunnel. I will find a goddamn light, man. <laughs> I hear it all. You, listen, when I tell you the weight on my back is so heavy of all the stuff that I deal with, and I'm fine. The reason why I'm fine is because I'm genuinely happy. I'm happy. And I'm not happy just because of the success. The success acts as a bonus. I'm happy because I truly know the definition and the feeling that comes with happiness. I truly know it. I felt it. I felt it when I said, yo, what really makes me happy? And I look at Heaven and Hendrix and I look at Zoe. I look at my wife. I go, yo, I didn't have the family shit when I was coming up. Yo, I got one. I got one. Look what I done did. Look what I built. These people depend on me. I provide for these people. That makes me happy. That makes me happy when my daughter comes up. Dad, you're not only my dad, you're my best friend. Yo, I'm happy. That's my world. So everything else from the outside that comes in, you're, you're, you're throwing shit at a, at, a, at a bubble that can't be popped. Mm. It's a force field around me. Yeah. It's a force field around me because what matters, what really matters, loves me wholeheartedly. And when you have that and you understand that, you're unbreakable. So if you don't add to that force field, if you don't make my force field stronger, you don't you don't you don't get time from me. My team, Heartbeat Productions, the people underneath my umbrella, you're a part of my force field. You believe what I believe. We all see the same things. We want the same things. So we march with the same beat. You can't, you can't shake that when you're an individual that's seen that and understands that. If you've never felt that, if you have no idea what that feels like, then it's easy to shake you. That's why some people are easily broken. Being broken is not a hard thing. It's not a hard thing. So those that do get broken, those that do get down, those that do get depressed, I understand. I understand. I don't, I don't knock people for it. Mm. I don't knock anybody for it. What I also understand is that the encouragement that can come from so many can add value for those that may need a little push. Mm. That may need a little, hey man, pick your chin up. It's so easy to be that positive reinforcement for somebody and add value. It's so easy. But some people choose to throw that aside and kick while you're down. I'm drawn to a lovely quote by St. Augustine in The City of God, where he says, it's a sin to judge any man by his post. Uh, in modern English, that would mean it's a sin to come to any of you who you should talk to dependent on their business card. It's not the post that should count. Um, and according to St. Augustine, it's only God who can really put everybody in their place. And he's going to do that on the day of judgment with angels and trumpets and the skies will open. Insane idea if you're a secular person like me, but something very valuable in that idea nevertheless. In other words, hold your horses when you're coming to judge people. You don't necessarily know uh, what someone's true value is. That is an unknown part uh, of them and we shouldn't behave as though uh, it, it is known. Perfection doesn't exist. It don't exist, Joe. Mm. We're, we're in a time right now where people expect perfection. You expect perfection. And I don't know where this came from. I don't know what happened that this is the criteria for living. My true understanding is, all right, you got one life. And that one life, the goal for us is to live it to the best of our ability from the beginning to what's at the end. In the middle, in the beginning, middle, 
You're going to do things. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fuck up. You're supposed to learn and then move forward with the understanding of what not to do. And when you move forward, life may get better. It may not. But somewhere along the lines, it's going to click. And everything that I went through back here was supposed to happen so that now that I'm here, I'm able to go ahead with such a high level of knowledge and I can make other people better. I can make myself better. I can do more for my family. Something happens. My dad is the prime example. Crazy drug addict. In and out of jail. Life was very bad. Very fucking bad for my dad. Son got successful. Son then took money. Gave it to his dad. Here's your house. Here's your truck. Here's your monthly. At this age, I want you to live your life. You done made mistakes. You can't rebuild and correct the things that you've done. I'm your son. I love you. You can't go back and, and redo. You can't try to keep going backwards. It ain't about me. You got grandkids. Mm. Go be the best grandpa you can be for these grandkids. That's your focus now. Where's this energy devoted to? Being a grandpa for the grandkids. Don't worry about me. But something happened in your life. Something happened that took you in the direction to reap the benefits of your son's happiness and success. My energy is now contagious enough and I hand it to you. So now you're able to give that off to all these other people that you're around. Something happens and that's in every single life. In every life. I understand that. There's a payoff for bad eventually. There's a payoff. It can't be bad but for so long. If you got the strength and the understanding to realize that, Shit will change. It will change. It's impossible. It's just like poker. I don't know if you play poker or not. I don't. If you play poker, you can run bad forever, but it will eventually turn around once you grasp the understanding of the game. Eventually, it's going to turn around. Blackjack, you're never going to beat the casino, but eventually you're going to have a good run. If you catch a run, you'll do good. Get the fuck out of there. You waited long enough for it to happen. Here it come. Catch it. Leave. Anything in life will eventually turn good. My really? mom reinforced knowledge. My mom reinforced you don't start things and not finish them. You don't quit. There's nothing that comes out of quitting besides knowing that you didn't finish. We finish everything. You start it, finish it. If you're going to do it, do it to try and be the best. Not be better than other people. Be the best for you. If you're in school and you're going to class, I'm not asking you to get straight A's. I'm asking you to get the best grade that you can possibly get. Give me 100% all the time and I'm a happy mother. When you half-ass me, I'm on your ass. 